Good morning. Uh, it is uh, my pleasure to start this morning's proceedings. Given uh, all the uncertainties over the next uh, 72 hours, I think um, the staff of the Van Leer Institute and Professor Goodfreund and uh, Professor Med Menachem will make various announcements. But for the time being, let us start our morning session. And it gives me great pleasure to introduce our two speakers, Roberto Lali and Alex Bloom, who are both collaborators in the research section um, on physics, quantum physics, many other projects under the leadership of Professor Jürgen Renn at the Max Planck Institute for the History of Science in Berlin. Um, it is my understanding that uh, Dr. Lali is engaged in a very interesting project on the history of the Nobel Prizes in Physics together with the Nobel Foundations, Foundation and Alex Bloom, uh, who has studied physics and uh, is a cosmopolitan member of our community, uh, bi-continental. Um, is studying recent developments in quantum theory. And please, welcome to the conference. And we hope that everything is going fine for the weather. And in the meantime, let me introduce the topic, the Renaissance of General Relativity. Since I'm the first speaker, I will do uh, roughly brief in historiographical introduction. It is commonly accepted that there was a sort of revitalization in the field of general relativity that was uh, in a period that goes from the 1950s to the 1920s. After a, a period of 30 years in which little progress was made and the field of general relativity was become to be seen as a, as a as a play for a handful of specialists, like a technical exercise very far from the experimental research of the period. A situation that has been cast by John Eisenstadt as the low watermark of general relativity. In the period after World War II and between the 50s and the 70s, all this changed, and this change has been uh, has been defined as the Renaissance of general relativity first by Clifford Weird, and after this name was used by a uh, host of other physicists and some historians of uh, science. And the period that goes from the 64 to the 74 has been named as the golden age of general relativity, because in that period, what is now the standard model of gravitational cosmology was actually uh, completed. But while there is a great consensus on the fact that the Renaissance actually occurred, there is not so great consensus on why it occurred and which were the definition and the time span of the Renaissance. This led some physicists and historians of science to give very different reasons of why it happened. Clifford Wild, who coined the term Renaissance of general relativity, gave strong importance to the empirical discovery that, according to him, sparked the Renaissance. In this view, uh, the Renaissance of generativity should be understood as a consequence on technological improvements following World War II and Cold War scientific research. According to this view, new technological advances made it possible for the first time a real connection between general relativity and the uh, experiential domain. A second proposal has been made by Clifford Will itself uh, by uh, some historian of science that gave strong importance to novel theoretical tools, in particular Perrault's spinor calculus that, according to Will, simplified the calculation and made the general relativity more uh, useful to solve specific problem, more simple to solve specific problem, and uh, Perrault's diagrams that made the... Uh, implication implication for the concept of space and time understandable, more intuitively understandable. 
Other physicists and historians of science that focused instead on the problem of the singularities of space-time gave a pretty similar, if though, uh, though not identical, definition when they stated that some theoretical tools like the Kruskal stackers uh, coordinates made it possible to understand what the singular singularities in the uh, Schwarzschild solution. Another explanation has been given that the alternative theories, in particular the brand sticker theories, the alternative theories of gravitation, and alternative theories of cosmology, in particular the steady state theory, sparked a host of research that was trying to understand if there was some uh, empirical evidence that could be understood as a proof of one or the other of the competing theories. More soci soci sociologically minded historians of science, in particular David Kaiser, gave a strong importance in sense of the change of the uh, scientific environment, of the pedo pedagogical transformation following World War II, and the growth in the number of uh, physicists. According to this view, the number of uh, qualified researchers, uh, the increasing of the number of the qualified researchers, and the increase of funds allowed uh, a flourishing of the uh, theoretical centers on general relativity and made it possible the construction of um, new centers in which uh, general relativity could be studied and improved. And that's a proposal that has been made in particular by Dan Kenneth in his remar remarkable book on the history of uh, gravitational radiation, gave a certain importance to the, in, to the transformation of the network connectivity that occurred in, in the 50s. According to this view, for the first time in the, from the 50s onward, the network of physicists and mathematicians working on general relativity <coughs> was such that the network was fully connected, while before the, the Renaissance period, it was very weak. It is very, uh, all these explanations are, are, have remarkable insights, but they have also limits. And we are trying to develop a joint project in the Max Planck Institute for the History of Science, including research in other institutions in order to, to understand the interconnection between these, these, uh, different, these different factors and other factors that have not been considered so far. And in, uh, in I'm presenting a part of this project, my personal contribution, that focuses in particular on the last point. I take it seriously that there was a change in the transformation of the network. I also think that if one looks to the network, some patterns that are not visible if one looks to content-related problems will uh, show up in a, in a way or another. There is, however, one important question that is important to ask before any kind of such network analysis could be actually undertaken. Was that only a quantitative phenomenon or there was a sort of changes in the practice of physics, physics in that period that actually allowed a change of the, trans of the transformation of the network. I'm particularly thinking about the communication channels that uh, were improved in that period in, a, in, a, in various ways that I will show up. As a purely quantitative analysis, it will lead us to believe that the number of physics just reached the, the threshold value and exceeded it in a specific period. This hypothesis might be also plausible because uh, the end of the World War II is, softly, is usually considered the, the starting point of what is called the Great Acceleration in the Anthropocene. In the Anthropocene. And the number of scientists grew as all the other factors. I mean, the increase of the exploitation of resources and the, the production need grew enormously after World War II, and uh, such did the number of scientists. And studies by David Kaiser show that the number of PhDs in physics grew even faster than in other branches of science. However, I think that as historians, we cannot uh, accept purely quantitative explanation before looking uh, more closely at what happened to the communication channels, to the projects uh, 
the scientists interested and working on general relativity pursued and on the uh, questions they made. I will focus in particular on the communications channels uh, to the related issue of the standard standardization processes. And I will show that they were very related, at least uh, the communication channels, the change of the communication channels, to the institutionalization of the research in the field of general relativity. Major actors in the field of general relativity that were important in the Renaissance had a very uh, deprimant view, a pressing view of what was the situation, the landscape of general relativity before that period. Infield wrote, the number of physicists working in this field in Princeton could be counted on the fingers on one hand. Relativity theory was not very highly estimated in the West and frowned upon in the East. Not that far went Peter Bergman when he told to Pais, you only had to know what your six best friends were doing and you would know what was happening in general relativity. <laughs> in Italian we would say poverini, little poor relativists. However, this image doesn't fit very well with we know. I mean that the some research done in the period of general relativity, the researcher who did that, were pretty unaware of what happened in the previous years and in previous decades. Uh, uh, a situation that has been cast as a meta theorem by John Starches, that if I remember correctly was, okay, I found it. Anything worth discovering in the field of general relativity has been discovered independently at least twice. At some time it happened that the second who discovered it got the name for that. However, the situation might be casted in a different way. Before the war, we can say it's pretty close to the true, <laughs> true six. The group's works in general relativity and general related problems were tied to both national and disciplinary boundaries. Each of these groups was pursuing its own research project. It had its own research agenda. It is following its developing, developing their own research tools. So there was a very scattered community. And if we look only at the construction of the, of the community, of the community building uh, activity, there was indeed a strong, a huge difference on what happened in the Renaissance period. I, uh, <coughs> I think that this steadily process might be, uh, might be summarized in five, five very important points. The first conference related almost exclusively to the uh, research on general relativity at Bern in 1955. The establishment of the International Committee on General Relativity and Gravitation was established in order to improve the connection between research in the field of the relativity that was, par was scattered in the in national boundaries and disciplinary boundaries, and also was uh, served as, as, a, as a way to make the, uh, the conferences a stable tradition to be repeated uh, every three years. Very important point, according to me, is the uh, publication of the Bulletin on General Relativity of Gravitation. The first number was published in 1962 and was published for eight years until in the 1970s it was absorbed in the first journal dedicated entirely to the field of general relativity and gravitation in the 1970s. The last, the end of the point, the most institutional part was the final establishment of the International Society on General Relativity and Gravitation. There is some controversies about the date, but they found it uh, possible December 1973 as the formal establishment. It is uh, uh, it, well, uh, soon after, in, in a couple of years, it became the Affiliate Commission on General Relativity and Gravitation of the uh, International Society for Pure and Applied in Physics. So we should keep this chronology in mind, and now I will, uh, will look more closely to the change, the transformation on the communication channels, channels in that period. So very, in a very general way, we can divide and we can find very different ways in which explicit knowledge, new results can be, can be uh, disseminated. There are books, as you know, and uh, papers. However, there are very different kinds of books with very different targets, uh, as you have seen yesterday. 
there are textbooks, there are popularizing popularization books, there are monographies in which one try to put together a research that uh, the author has been made for, for some time. And also the papers we can, uh, we can separate between research papers and review papers. So to, to give a very schematic categorization of the communication means of explicit knowledge of, of uh, formal knowledge, we have monography of textbooks that uh, present in a co co coherent way or at least try to, to present in a coherent way research that has already been made. And in textbooks, we found also some specific theoretical, uh, specific tools and the problems to which it should be, they, they should be applied. We have also uh, research papers in which novelty, novel research products are for the first time made public and they had to be still digested by the uh, scientific community. And we have uh, review papers in which uh, previous uh, recent development are summarized and there is for the first time a bibliography, a bibliography of the subject because of their, of their features, review papers easily become the first uh, step toward the standardization of a recent development in a particular field or a particular topic. Besides those, we have also the communication of written communication through papers. So we learned yesterday how important letters are for the communication between scholars and they are still written knowledge even if though they are not public, may be made public in a following period, and so they are still in the range of written knowledge. There are oral knowledge that may be disseminated in conferences, work workshops, meetings of various types, and have more closer and longer collaboration. The last two ways to disseminate knowledge were just the two that changed radically, dramatically, after in the period of the Renaissance. We learned from the interviews to actors of the period that the conferences were very important. So we can look more closely to the conference. The first one was in Bern. It was, it was a celebration, the 50th anniversary of the special relativity, but it was devoted almost completely to general relativity. In this presidential address, Wolfgang Pauli tried to to make categories to put the topics that have been explored and during the, the conference in five different, five different types. Experimental verification of GR, cosmology, mathematical methods, expansion of the theory, and he meant in particular unified field theory, working the unified field theory, and quantization of the field equation. Pali's uptent was actually very important to try to make order in the variety of topics that were actually presented during the conference. Indeed, the situation at the time was like that. There were already in 1955 few research centers. Here I list only uh, some of them, not all, because they will be important in the, uh, in the follows. These groups were actually pursuing different research agendas still. There were the Stockholm, Hamburg, and the Paris groups that were working on unified field theories. There was only two talks about quantum quantization of uh, general relativity. The most important was surely Bergman's talk. Some of these groups were working still on cosmology, um, cosmology, but from different perspective. And it was a very, um, very, um, very difficult to put this, all these research topics together. Also, we can see in this, in this map that there were uh, some new research centers that were created just in that period, in particular in the United States in the East, in the East Coast, but they were not present at the Berg Conference. They were instead present at the Chapel Hill Conference, and were maybe the, among the main actors, and indeed, the presence of quantum research in quantization of general relativity was much more strong than in the previous conference. 
Almost 30% of the talks were devoted to quantum gravity, while in Bern, just two over 35. However, even th though the situation may be considered still scattered, in after these two conferences, that was the first recognition that there was a core set of knowledge and problems that were, were of interest for all the researchers, whatever research they were pursuing. After the first conference in Bern, Bergman wrote, the very fact that interest in general relativity has recently increased through the world is indicative of the fact that its implications have not yet been fully worked out and exploited for our understanding of the physical universe as an organic world. Of a similar tone, Wheeler's introduction to a session of the Chapelier conference. Talking about the initial value problem, he said, this is one of the most important problems of relativity theory, and one may well be believe that it must be solved before further progress with quantization of the theory can be made. So there was uh, an agreement that there, there should be much, some progress in the general relativity, in pure general relativity, in order to pursue their own different research projects. And this was actually recognized uh, at the Royamon conference that was a turning point during this conference, it was decided to build an international committee to make this conference a stable a per, um, periodical event. And this was based on the recognition that there was a field called general relativity and gravitation that included all the different activities. Besides this large conference, there were other ways that mathematic, mathematicians and physicists working particular physicists working on generally relativity related problems, uh, different ways that they developed to meet, to discuss recent work that was not, was not yet published. In particular, I'm thinking to the Syracuse meeting that were very important because it provided a forum for the meeting of two large groups, the Syracuse and the Princeton group, and other, and other smaller groups and some isolated researchers were in the same area, the, west, uh, the east part of the United States. And then thinking also to quite important Santa Barbara conference in 1962 that was ideated to put the mathematician, the relativist, talking with each other in Kerr's words. Actors, uh, main, many leaders of the time, uh, or younger researchers of the time, saw the conferences as an important step at the smaller meeting as well. And they found very different, they suppose very different function that the conferences had. Besides the more trivial one that for the disseminating of a new knowledge, the discussion of, and the production, uh, so the production of, of uh, of some important way to see this, say, this is some problem of interest for the various research groups. One was the development of new research agendas. After the 1955 conference, Bonded actually decided that his own recently founded group in London, the King's Law College, would devote this activity to the research on gravitational radiation because the topic was, was discussed in a very healthy manner during the Bern conference. It shaped career. Kerr met Alfred Schild at the Santa Barbara conference and after this meeting, it was invited to join the recently funded uh, Center for Relativity Theory in Texas. And it also provided for some a better understanding of the theory itself. Louis Witten, Recall that he understood the theory, really understood the theory during the Stevens conferences. So they had a more multifaceted function within the community, the, the, the newborn community on general relativity and gravitation. But this was not the only change. The other one was the radical transformation, the way in which uh, physicists in particular, however, uh, scientists working on general relativity and gravitation related problems worked. We can, uh, in a schematic way, divide between two different ways of collaboration. One with a well-defined, identifiable leader, 
I mean, the PhD supervisor, for example, and this student, uh, we can also see a much a more democratic uh, team of work when the the group is formed by people of, of more or less the same social status, often coming from different backgrounds. And just the second type of collaboration changed radically. Before, well, since the end of the 1950s, the first one was actually predominant. From the 1950s onward, the second type became really important. It produced uh, good science. It was also important from an, just a quantitative perspective. To quote only three of the various papers that was written for interinstitutional collaboration of researchers, more or less on the same social level, and more younger, more younger scholar, the ADM formalism, the Robinson Tottenham work on null dust solution, and the Goldberg Sachs theorem. This change in the way in which scholars collaborated was considered by some one of the most important transformations in the Renaissance period. For example, Ted Newman recalled that between 1960 and 1962, the entire theory of gravitational radiation was developed by the strong interaction of many workers from Syracuse, London, Hamburg, and Warsaw, via personal contacts and word of mouth communication. The high quality of the science came, at least partially, from this exchange of ideas. So we uh, see this is also a pretty uh, idealistic um, perspective, but it also pretty believe it actually happened that there were uh, works created by uh, scientists, younger scientists working in different institutions. So there was, there was developing, we maybe should be studied from the virtue perspective, this, <laughs> this sentence and the way in which they saw itself as, as a, proponents, a new way of collaboration in the, in the scientific enterprise. But this also said that something was really changed in the way in which no knowledge traveled. And there was a certain importance of this travel of younger researchers from one center, one research center to another. They were not only bringing their own knowledge baggage, they were knowing other tools, other way to see same problems. I also see how their own tools might be employed to, to, to other research agendas. This, so we can, you can, I think, agree that the communication channels changed in a pretty radical way in the Renaissance period, and we may also try to define the Renaissance itself using this sociological definition that is the period when this communication, personal communication, reached uh, a high level and allowed a more fast, a productive dissemination of knowledge. To understand why they were so essential, however, we might relate them to what was the situation for what concerned the written, the, the, the way in which written knowledge was, was disseminated. The situation was, was um, Summarized by André Mercier in his editorial introduction to the first issue of the new journal General Relativity and Gravitation, he stated that the journal was indeed necessary because the situation was a mess. Relativists have to look for their bread in all sorts of bakeries. They sell mostly a lot of words which are not they seek. The literature is disseminated in a way unbearable in our day of functionalism. And indeed, uh, Mercier um, made the case that he studied that the papers on generativity were published in more than 80 journals, and this was one of the reasons for, for, for the new publication. In fact, Mercier was pretty optimistic. The publication, the 1,500 papers uh, uh, concerning generativity and gravitation that were published in the bulletin, were, were published in more than 200 journals in uh, at least six different languages, I think eight, but I have to finish my exploration, and one of these was Esperanto. So we have a very strong dissemination of knowledge, a very difficult way in which written knowledge could reach other, other, other groups, in particular other parts of the world. 
Uh, for others, we mean in particular publication on general science related to a particular national scientific community. Most of these papers were published to, um, still, uh, it is still on the basis of uh, local politics. Bergman, for example, till 1960s published all his paper, uh, almost all his paper in the Physical Review and uh, the Journals of the American Physical Society, and in turn, um, uh, Physical Review published almost exclusively papers written in, um, the, um, by American scholars or scholars working in American institutions at that, that period. The same was true in the French community, uh, Lichnerowitz and Tonella published in Complain Du and other French journals, and the same was also true in Poland and so forth and so on. So the community was still scattered at the time, the publication didn't help to bridge the community. So uh, the, uh, the meetings, the conferences, the, more sh the, the, the smaller interinstitutional uh, workshops, and the travel of uh, younger scholars really created a bridge between these <coughs> different research centers. It is pretty simple to understand which were the material condition that allowed that. The material condition being already explored partially by David Kaiser. Uh, there was the growth of funding, the growth of uh, PhDs, and younger PhDs. And this created also a sort of breakdown between the number of physicists and the number of stable position. What happened was a cascade, a postdoc cascade. And in what happened in, the in general relativity was that this postdoc could travel from uh, one research center to another pretty, I will not say easily, but uh, yeah, almost easily, because it was actually happened. Robinson, Evo Robinson, in three years, between 1959 and 62, visited nine different research centers, and the same hold true for many of the younger scholars who made important contribution in that period. A striking example uh, might be Pirani. In, in the way in which the postdoc cascade, the, the transfer from one place to another, allowed uh, the production of new knowledge in which he put together broken pieces of knowledge that he took from different places. Actually, he produced a breakthrough paper in 1957, in variant of formulation of general radiation theory, put it together three different pieces of information. The uh, review of the pattern of classification published in very short review, as you can see, uh, published in mathematical reviews. Um, some parts of the work on uh, special relativity, the special theory uh, of which he was reading the proofs. And uh, at the same time, he was reviewing the paper McWitty, in which he was trying to show that spherical uh, radiation were not allowed in general relativity. What allowed that was the particular position of Piranin in, as a node of a network, of the institutional intellectual network. He had made his PhD in, uh, in an American university, Carnegie Institute of Technology, Carnegie Institute of Technology, and so was part of the American, uh, American uh, uh, Mathematical Society who published the uh, mathematical reviews. So it was uh, 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 was a reviewer of the journal. The second, mm, after taking the, the PhD, he, became, he was doing a s second PhD with Bondi, who was interested, who got interested in the gravitational radiation. At the same time, he, w he spent one year as a fellow at the Dublin Institute of, uh, for Advanced of Study. And for this reason, he was reading the proof of uh, relativity, the special theory. So at this time, uh, Pirani was really at the center of a network of theoretical tools, research project, and institution. Where for institution, I intend, uh, intend institution in a broader sense, not only institution, localized institution, but more delocalized, such as the uh, journal like mathematical reviews. Besides the conferences and the, uh, 
and the postdoc cascade, there were two other strategies that were actually employed in 1962 to improve the communication between the scholars working on GRG and related fields. But they, uh, instead, um, that this is a difference with the other two, were conscious steps, decided steps. The first one was the publication of the Bulletin on General Relativity and Gravitation, and the second one was the publication of two edited volumes in which recent development of the field was exposed and put together for the first time. What happened? Okay. So, the Bulletin on General Relativity and Gravitation contained very useful information for the community. A list of 223 scholars who were working on the field or just interested on the field, the subjects on which were they working, and the uh, bibliography of, uh, of papers of interest, of interest for, for, the, for the entire community, the newborn community. We can see the letter to Merci to, to the scholars. It's very interesting the, to the scientists through the world active in the field of uh, the theories or general to the general relativity and gravitation. The edited volumes were a collective effort to put together the various views, the various uh, research projects and that were related to uh, newborn field of general relativity and gravitation. And we will see from the reviews of these papers how it was perceived by, by, by the scholars. Mr. V thought that was a very important step because much unpublished work was communicated by word of mouth to those few in Chapman circles of Princeton, Versailles, and London. This was a way to communicate to a broader circle these advances. And the other uh, review of Bergman, the editor com editorial committee took success in presenting several approaches in those areas in which opinions widely differ rather than selecting orthodox view. There was no, no intention to create an orthodoxy, a standard. There was still a scattered, a scattered community, but they were trying, however, to build some pieces of common knowledge, or at least in which they can, some values in which they can actually confront. And that, uh, to see that it was really scattered, we can see the, the fields of interest that were um, listed in the first number of the, pub, uh, of the bulletin. We can see in German dynamics, quantization, particular solution, and so uni three different uh, unified field theories. It seems that what they present, the way in which they try to categorize the, the, the various activities was just to give the different names of what the different research groups were trying to do. So, uh, while the postdoc cascade, the growth funding, was a very general process, the bulletins, and in a certain sense also the edited volumes, uh, the, the inter-institutional collaboration was very peculiar on the newborn uh, GRG community. And we can see which were the main two differences. On the one hand, it, sh it had to be necessarily international because it was small. In order to have a certain uh, importance in the scientific, inter international scientific landscape, it had to be an international community that could have some relevance in the number of the growing scientific enterprise. But also we have seen that there was a sort of artific artificial construction of communication channels, in particular with the bulletins, that we don't found anywhere in the same period in the same kind of, uh, of activities. Since the society was not really pursuing s the same kind of uh, support, was, there was no orthodoxy, no um, agreement, on, even on the most important way in which general relativity should be uh, developed. This created a quite artificial way to put the, the stick, the various project together. And this bits to the second part, but I will be very short on that. Uh, at the outset of the Renaissance was soon understood that there was a need for, for a standardization. Wheeler wrote to a private sponsor that the DeWitts proposed to do something that has long needed doing, help make clear the fundamental facts and principle of general relativity so clearly and is inescapable that every competent worker knows what is right and what is wrong. A dream. But unfortunately, the society was not built to do that, and indeed, uh, the various conferences 
besides the Shapiro conference that had the different structures was much more smaller, was not trying to create such a standard. It was pretty clear to Feynman when he wrote to his wife, this uh, letter is pretty known, it's been reported by, so by Dan Kenfick, but it's pretty nice, so we read some of that. I didn't get anything out of this meeting, the 1962 meeting in Jablona. Because there are no experiments, this field is not an active one. So few of the best men are doing work in it. The result is that there are a host of dopes here and it's not good for my blood pressure. There is a great deal of activity in the field these days, but this activity is mainly in showing that the previous activity of somebody else resulted in an error and in nothing useful or in nothing promising. Okay. Uh, just to last sense, remind me not to come anymore to gravity conferences. <laughs> Actually, the, in the next, yeah, the next uh, semester, he began teaching general relativity. And so there is a <laughs> probably he just didn't agree with what was produced. And we have to recognize that uh, it was very difficult to create a, the standard in, uh, in a situation that was still so scattered. In with, if we see to the community, we see that the, the scientists who were part of the community were highly estimated scientists, but the reason the criteria uh, among this community was, was built were quite different, was, were that representativity of the different uh, research projects and of, uh, of, uh, also of the different uh, geographical area. They were good as administrators in particular because they had to create connection with the larger scientific society in order to make the general relativity a very important field. This is, was the, the real and the most important uh, uh, activity of the international community that could be recognized even by other scholars as very important scholars are doing this, uh, this job and we can believe that there are some standards and the field is not uh, for looking for a vacuum. So the way in which they tried actually to uh, to to create some standard was not in, uh, and I'm going to, to conclude, was not try, uh, through the international committee, but was by recognizing that there were some journals that were following uh, particular standards such as uh, physical review, in particular physical review letters in the 60s, and the newborn and NASA physics and the journal of mathematical reviews, and they were um, working on the well recognizable uh, referring process, and the, in this journal they also beat general activity and gravitation. So this was one of the standards. The other were the two volumes I, I mentioned before. They were a way to create some sort of leadership in the field. But this is what beginners of a begin of, of a standardization, but it was concluded only after astrophysical uh, discoveries had made uh, created a, a more strong contact with the experiential domain. And so we can find that various textbooks, but I mentioned here the two most important gravitation by Misner, Thorne, they thank to Beer, and Wheeler. In 1973, and uh, also very important, as somewhat related to the first one, the problem broken relativity and gravitation. In this point, the connection with physics was made very clear, and relativity has become a tool to solve physical problems. And I read the conclusion. <laughs> so a little bit faster. After World War II, the landscape of the research in general relativity was not very different from what was before the war. A collection of small research groups separated by national and disciplinary boundaries, largely pursuing different research agendas. The situation changed dramatically from the mid 1920s, uh, 50s, sorry, onward, when scientists working on GRG related problems began to explore different ways of communication and collaboration. The cooperative environment created to face common questions was pretty different from the situation in the 1930s when scientists were mostly trying to promote their own approach and to win controversies against other schools often belonging to national traditions. A series of new practices such as long postdoctoral education and explicit community building realized through the organizational conferences and the publication of the bulletin effectively improved the communication of novel resources and ideas. The relevance of postdoctoral training in the transmission and production of knowledge and elasticity, and elasticity that they showed in passing from one center group, uh, research groups to another, 
might lead to conclude that the classical view image of theoretical schools in competition and relationship is not a good one as a framework to describe what happened in the process in the Renaissance of generativity, at least in the period I have talked about, mid 1920s, early 1960s. If for theoretical schools, we intend to define the structure that aims at developing and transmitting specific theoretical tools and to solve determinate problems, the situation after the war was not as rigid as the theoretical school image suggests. A better name would probably be elastic research groups, whose stability was related to the persistence of one leader and this more or less defined research project. The elasticity of the institutional structure of many research groups working on GRG-related subjects was probably one of the reasons why they were so ready to change the targets of their research endeavors as soon as it was understood that new astrophysical discoveries could be understood and analyzed, and analyzed in the framework of generativity. The variety of research agendas, on the other hand, caused that the institutional structure created to organize the activity of such a heterogeneous community was in part artificial. Mercier was the secretary of the International Committee and later of the society was no doubt one of the major actors in the explicit community building and his efforts effectively improved the communication between different scholars with the publication of the bulletin and the categorization of research activities. Given the status of the community and of knowledge in the field of GRG between the 1950s and the beginning of the 1960s, the International Commission was not created to establish defined standards for research in GRG. Although this problem was felt by some of the most important leaders of the field, the need for identification of standards was counterbalanced by the need for the establishment of a strong community namely a community that has a significant number of members and useful connection with other uh, research fields and other also funding agencies. This need led to the creation of an international committee intended as the representative subjects, subject of the great variety of approach and able to strengthen the presence of the GRG-related research in the scientific world. More defined standards were eventually established only after astrophysical discoveries and the successful explanation of such discoveries in the framework of general relativity had led to the identification of a more successful approach in GR proper from the GR proper framework, now unrelated to any extension of the theory to other realm of physics, at least in the standard of uh, presented to the to the other scholars. Thank you for the attention. Okay, does it work? Thank you very much. Thanks very much. Okay. We have some people here. If you don't mind, I'll moderate the questions. Yes, we sure. have, uh, let's take 10 minutes before the next lecture. Yes, please. Um, um, let you articulate this. <coughs> um, <coughs> First of all, I, I think it's a wonderful reconstruction. I was not, it was a baby at the time, so I was not there. <coughs> but um, <coughs> I find that this reconstruction captures exactly the spirit of what I hear from all the people of that generation, which I met at later times. And uh, it, uh, it fits very well with I, what, what the, the, the little pieces I know about this history. <coughs> it's very good, it's wonderful. But uh, can, do you allow me to make a a methodological, uh, it's a uh, critic, or attempt of a critic, or reaction, and say, well, in a sense, this is a, this shed a lot of light of what happened in that research, in that period, and that it's wonderful, um, by shutting off uh, the core of the story, which is the science itself, in a sense. A little bit of a description, it's like describing a concert uh, uh, in silence. Um, one of the things that happened, of course, is that uh, it's completely unrelated to the people, the meeting, the conference, the, 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 uh, all that, uh, which is that some equations uh, actually happened, started to describe the world and started to uh, be understood. Uh, uh, this is a, 
I'm, I'm just reacting as a scientist, uh, listening to a sociological approach, uh, description of scientific uh, uh, activity. If, if on one hand uh, it shed light on, on, on the history, isn't there, uh, in, from this perspective, a risk of not seeing that uh, the actual engine that allowed all that uh, is not really the fact that people travel and started talking to one another or whatever, uh, but is the fact that uh, there was a fertile uh, 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 set of equations <laughs> uh, that uh, started flourishing. Thank you very much for the questions. Um, I have to clarify that this is a part of a larger project that will involve very various perspective. I don't think that the Renaissance or generativity can be understood only from one perspective. And so I presented my part of this uh, project. It is a very large project that involves a number of researchers. And the construction, the common uh, understanding of the process should be, uh, we should wait a little bit more <laughs> research. However, tomorrow, if there's no allows, there will be a presentation of the second part of this uh, project. I mean, something that is put together, both the sociological perspective and the scientific perspective that will be uh, given by Jurgen Ren. And I don't mention yet that actually even this work was created in a collaboration. So I took this sociological perspective. We, we have a, like a division of labor. I don't believe that this is the true and we were for it's not a sociological reconstruction of uh, I don't mean that this is, but there are important factors that has not been uh, much explored and that should just taken into account. And we will try to be the more, more complex and multifaceted story of this huge process, was a huge process. So thank you for the question that allowed me <laughs> to promote the conference tomorrow. It's a very important <laughs> point that it summarizes many of the questions you also made. Well, thank you very much. Um, can you hear me? Uh, I was more or less struck by um, the fact that the distribution of centers and the collaborations you described uh, seem to exclude completely the people working in the Soviet Union. Uh, and so my question is, uh, were they not related to those collaborations at all? And if so, did that have an impact on whether there was a renaissance uh, amongst the Soviet uh, general relat relativists? Uh, yeah, yeah. So that, or is the, or, well, in, in any sense, could you uh, comment on uh, what happened to the Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. The, the Thank you for the question again. It's, it's a very important point. Uh, this map represents only the research centers that were active in the, even only f from one month, <laughs> active in the 19 1955 and from the work I studied were the basis for the connection and for the postdoctoral cascade travel. So for uh, the work of these centers were connected to each other. The connection with other groups had to be explored, but I guess that they um, they travel through other groups indeed and it's not represented here there was a very a bit pretty huge indian group huh? based on vaidya or the father of narlika they were pursuing research in general relativity in particular from a mathematical perspective but they had no uh, relevance for what concerns the transmission of knowledge through persons so we uh, have to understand how my idea equation came to be seen as an important equation in the Renaissance of general relativity and, uh, and other uh, transmission knowledge from these centers that um, were not listed here, but as far as I have uh, read and studied, they were not part of this kind of connection. Of course, we have a folk in Leningrad, we have gay owls in Bruxelles, of course, you are not in this picture, because in just in the period of 55, 62, people didn't use to travel there. So and so the Catania and Rome, sorry. I'd like to follow up with the question related. Why were there no U.S. scientists in Bern, and were there any Soviet scientists in Bern, 1955? Fock was in Bern, 
uh, also other uh, Soviet scholars were, were, were in Bern, but they mm. didn't pursue in the following years research. So I think that was important was Ivanenko was not there, for example, after he took a very strong uh, uh, position in promoting in the Soviet uh, Union research and general relativity, but it happened later. So the reason uh, Bergman was, was there, I think that the connection, because Bergman was the only one that was understood as making uh, progress in the general relativity. Uh, unfortunately, the paper on Mercier have been lost. And this is a very, very uh, terrible thing for historians. So we have to reconstruct him based on the other sources. But uh, what happened was uh, Pauli suggested the name. He was the president, and Bamese uh, took the organization. And people was invited to talk, so they took the experts of the field, or what they believed to be the experts right. of the field. It's, it, I think the political situation in the world in 1955 56, 59, 62, I believe sh should be a should be a, raw, a, a bullet point in your Yeah, 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 <laughs> no, yeah, 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 yeah completely. Um, yeah. It's yeah, yeah. the Cold War, uh, purges in, in, in Soviet science, changes in the academy, people are not talking, there is still rationing going on in Europe, in England, uh, America, there's isolationism, so I think the political situation and the personal connections of people like Pauli or, would be interesting to explore. I, it's only a suggestion. I know I, 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 time today I, to do it. Oh. I, I completely agree. If I can follow up, I just want to say that Mercier was, was uh, Switzerland was very important in the construction of the international community because it was seen as neutral. So a good place in which to base the international committee. It was seen as by some people. Yeah, but the International Committee agreed. Yeah, I know. <laughs> uh, thank you, Roberto, for a very interesting talk. Um, so uh, to come back to the question that uh, Carlo Rovelli raised, um, um, I was reminded very much by your talk uh, of the paper uh, of James Seckord on the circulation of knowledge, which is, I think, about 10 years old, came out in ISIS about a decade ago. And, and part of the points that Seckhard emphasizes is that when knowledge circulates, meaning when scholars meet and, and bring two traditions together, just the meeting itself, you know, just the having the, uh, uh, the necessity to adopt a new knowledge and learning new knowledge already creates knowledge. You know, like just, you know, when, when somebody trained in quantum field theory needs to learn himself general relativity, then he starts phrasing the theory in a new way, in, in, in a way that's amenable to him and therefore produces a new way of looking at the theory. Could you, on the basis of the network that you draw out and, and the new communication channels that you uh, uh, lay before us, could you point to specific instances where exactly the network actually shows new knowledge being produced so that uh, uh, Carlo uh, uh, sees where this network analysis actually tells you where the equations are produced by the circulation of knowledge? I mean, uh, the most, uh, the most I can sample, I think that is, this, I mean, I don't, that they were not on the, uh, f from the point of view of historical sources, it's very difficult to understand what happened actually in the meeting, in the, uh, at least there are interviews, but it's very difficult to understand what, what changed radically during meeting. But from what happened in the circulation uh, due to the transmission from one, uh, from one institution to another, and the connection between different uh, different pieces of knowledge that agglomerate in a particular period, I think that Pirani's example is, uh, is a good one. Uh, I mean, it should be explored in a much <laughs> deeper way, of course, trying to see exactly in which I, that is, uh, of course, very important to do that, but of course, it's not, time, not time to do it. But we have two more uh, comments. Okay. Um, while I walk, I just wanted to say um, the comment, the Feynman letter that you quoted is very reminiscent of Einstein's letters after the Solvay conference. Remember? I learned oh, yeah, okay. Thank you for, thank you for... Uh, no, I wanted to come back to the, this, this methodological discussion because we are dealing with so many scientists in this period that just the history of idea approach doesn't help. And unfortunately, you know, with 
previously, you know, in the old days, the history of science always suffered from this uh, methodological division between internalist and externalist. In the more recent 20th century Cold War science, we are suffering from another kind of division, namely uh, the division between a sociological and just a content-based approach. And I think what we are trying to do, and, I, what, and Roberto just gave a beautiful example with the Pirani story, is to integrate them and show how these network structures become enabling structures for creating knowledge just as you said, uh, Jaron. And of course, you know, to do that in detail for every single example is kind of hard. But you first have to create, and this is really the challenge that we are facing, methodological tools like, uh, you know, the concept of communication channels, uh, the identification of networks, and so this is all really novel in our field. It's a bit like, you know, experimental and theoretical science coming together. And you need to have a lot of data. The sources, as Roberto just said, don't always give you you know, the informal communication part, you know, you have the larger context. So to put all these dimensions together is really a challenge. Benefit and the last one. Thank you, Dan. I just wanted to mention and on the issue of the Soviet Union and so on, uh, certainly there were uh, uh, direct funding difficulties because of Cold War issues. So a major source of funding for general relativity at this time was the United States Air Force. And both uh, Herman Bondi and Felix Perani, who were in the King's College group in London, mentioned to me that uh, difficulty for them was that provided them with some of their money, but they couldn't use that money for their interactions with the group in Poland, Info's group in Poland, because they were, out, they were not in NATO. And, and Joshua Goldberg has actually written about his frustrations and like he felt uh, he, it, was, it was okay for him to give money to the Hamburg group, but he wanted to fund a group in Belgium and he wasn't allowed to. No. Uh, so there were definitely just straightforward funding issues. You could fund certain things and you couldn't fund certain other things. Even though people did want to have, uh, you know, connections with Falk and so on, for instance, the, the international committees and so on included him. Thank you. I'm sorry, we have only time for one more. Oh, Kip, I had hands up. Thank you. Uh, you highlighted the fact that uh, the golden age, which followed right after this uh, initial renaissance, was triggered to some extent at least by the interaction with other fields, particularly with astronomical observations and theoretical astrophysics. So I think a very interesting question is what was going on in this renaissance era in terms of interaction with other fields? Feynman represents one reaction of that, the absence, from his point of view, of ties to other fields. In the Soviet Union, however, you had the landau lefschitz kalatnikov school, uh, which would dip into this field and then go off and work in different fields. They, they were very broad, and they made in this uh, period, in the la latter part of this period, important contributions in terms of perturbations of cosmology in the beginning of their work on generic singularities. Uh, but uh, they were not, in this period, connected to the West directly because of uh, the Cold War barriers. Uh, and you had, uh, in the West, you had Wheeler, who was entering this field, uh, coming from nuclear physics, but bringing in tools and ideas from nuclear and particle physics in, into the field. So there was some amount of interaction with other fields, but much, much less than in the later era. And I think it would be very interesting to, to, to probe more deeply what those interactions were, uh, what impact did they have, and uh, why did not, they not have more impact in, in this Renaissance era? Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much for the comment. Just to show you, this is uh, one of the targets to build a network of uh, these guys, including Soviet, and as far as we can, able to find sources and stories. Thank you very.